The Guardian. Guardian Podcasts are partnered with audible.co.uk. For a free download, be sure to check out guardian.co.uk slash audible, where Guardian listeners can choose any audiobook for free. See the page for more details. The Guardian Books Podcast with Claire Armistead. What will life be like in the future? Will we see gleaming cities and unimagined scientific marvels in the years to come? In this moving picture, we'll peer across time into the year 2000, into the astounding world of the future. Gaze upon the city of tomorrow, magnificent architecture. What will the world look like in 2050? What trends will shape our lives? How will we live, travel and work? These are the questions that we must ask ourselves today. Many have tried, most have failed. Predicting the future is never easy. And whatever anyone forecasts is on the record forever. We are facing a new era. The century of oil is ending. Natural resources are becoming scarce. And the Earth's climate is threatened. Early morning, semi-detached Highgate, London. Industrial consultant Rex Malek feels the business world's pulse from his bedside. Stock prices and market trends are available to him through Europe's first home computer terminal. The future, as we know, is very unpredictable. The best minds in the best institutions generally get it wrong. This is in technology, this is in the area of politics, and it's clearly in the area of finance, where the institutions established to think about the future, the IMF, the BIS, the Financial Stability Forum... Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation because the profit invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that in 20 or at most 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Well, as you've probably gathered, talk about the future is pretty much all the rage in the books world these days. But Parche Arthur C. Clarke, the jury is out on whether that future will prove to be fantastic or fatal. And the challenges of the digital age are not simply technological and industrial. More and more authors are also engaging in the discussion about how this period of rapid change is destabilising our whole society, politically, economically, environmentally, in fact, in every way you can think. That's the burden of Nick Harkway's book, The Blind Giant, and he's here in the studio now talking to Richard Lee. After the gone away world and Angel Maker, people might have expected you to be settling down to a career writing apocalyptic kung fu adventures. Uh, so what can a novelist like you tell us about living in the future? I think probably only novelists like me think about it, because generally speaking, um, when people think about the future, they try to think about something that's very much like now, but with shinier computer screens or something. People are very shy of actually wondering how the future will differ from the present day. I spend my time thinking up wild ways in which the future could be different. But you think this kind of fictional cast, this wild and wacky imagination, is vital for imagining the future, and so therefore for analysing it? I think when you write fiction, particularly when you write kind of wild, strange fiction, it's an act of taking the brakes off. You're not allowed to think, oh, that's silly, I won't go down that road. And when you're looking at the future, you have to be prepared to have that conversation. And actually, that's very much the thrust of the last section of the book, is kind of, look, you know, quite a lot of the time when something is, even now, kind of obviously going to happen in the next four to five years, we still preface it by saying, oh, it sounds like science fiction, but very soon we'll be able to grow organs on a polymer frame and implant them. And you think, well, that's crazy, though, because you can't keep saying it sounds like science fiction as a way of saying, oh, you can ignore this, which is really what people do, particularly, you know, um, saving your presence in, in news organisations. The BBC is particularly guilty of this, actually. But uh, you have to say, OK, it's happening now. You know, we, we're going to be able to do this very soon, and what will it mean? So is, is that why you've chosen to write about this now, right now? I started writing The Blind Giant Beak because I needed to get straight in my own head, really, what was happening at this moment. And this moment is slightly special because we are in this kind of high Baroque period of digital culture where we've got 
digital tools and digital toys and we're wandering around our houses and our society and so on looking for things that we can attack digitally or that we can do digitally, like a bloke with a hammer which is just bought from a hardware store, wandering around the house looking for things to hit. For some things, digital technology is excellent. It does them really well. For other things, you want f- clockwork. If I'm uh, wandering around with a satellite phone and a clockwork radio, if the satellite phone breaks, I, there's no chance I'm going to be able to fix it. There's just none. But if I've got a clockwork radio and something goes wrong, I might be able to improvise a spring or so, you know, take it apart and so on. So the question is, where will we apply these technologies and how, and where will actually digital turn out to be a rotten technology? And the choices that we make now will determine the kind of future we have. The interesting thing is we're coming to awareness through digital technology uh, and social media and so on, we're coming to an awareness almost in real time of the choices we're making. So for the first time, we can make choices, see where they are taking us and decide, oh, I don't like that possible future, so I might pick another one. And if we do that in sufficient numbers, if we discuss it and so on, then yes, we can actually sort of start to influence our own future in a way which we really probably haven't been able to before. Because even when I was growing up, if you made a sort of five-year, ten-year plan, you weren't really going to know whether it had worked for 20 or 30 years at the earliest. Now we have a situation where you can start to see, particularly with sort of public open data initiatives and so on, you can start to see what's happening in real time and go, oh, that idea sounded great. It's rubbish. For goodness sake, let's do something else. And this is a responsibility that's before all of us. I mean, is it not that with greater knowledge comes greater power, but almost more complicity and the things that are going wrong around us. Absolutely. There's certainly that. I mean, as digitisation of uh, society offers us opportunities to participate in effectively in government and the business of governing ourselves, and you can see this very clearly if you take a look at places like California, which have kind of citizen initiatives on the ballot a lot of the time, is that you can get trouble if you aren't very, very sensible about what you choose to do. The Californians have a problem where they keep voting themselves tax breaks and at the same time keep voting for public services which they want not to have to pay for. Um, California, I believe, is very nearly broke or or it may even be officially broke. And that's what happens if you don't take responsibility for the fact that you now have greater power and greater influence. And in very small ways, microscopic decisions that we make every day. So if you don't like AN supermarket and the way it handles town centres, then try to shop somewhere else. Mm. You speak a lot about how the we need to survive the internet or the digital future, about how we're kind of surrounded by this stuff and how it's almost attacking us with information. I think that's definitely a perception, and it's definitely the perception that I'm describing in the book. In fact, information overload is, is a term from the 70s, from Alvin Toffler's book, Future Shock. Um, and as you go back in time, uh, I think you find people talking about that kind of dissolution um, pretty much in every decade and in every century. But someone always believes the world is coming to an end because the world isn't the way they expected it to be. Uh, we have sort of two predominant streams. One which is sort of the search for meaning goes through the human heart, through psychology, through emotions and so on. And that culture is very strongly kind of literary and theatrical and so on. And then you have a, a, a sort of science culture which is facts-based and so on. Um, and that also has a kind of search for truth, for meaning going on. And they are in some ways at loggerheads and they don't always behave very nicely with one another. Really the kind of cultural sphere sort of controls the intellectual dialogue in the UK. Uh, Snow complained that Rutherford was being written out of culture and Eliot was being written in. It flows in both directions. I, you know, I was at university, the guy next door to me was a particle physicist who said in as many words that he didn't think ethics had anything to do with science. The conception of what it meant to be educated, what it meant to, to understand the world in, in sort of, sort of earlier centuries was much broader. You know, you had to understand science, you must understand mathematics and the beauty of mathematics, as well as be able to play a musical instrument, as well as speak several languages. And, you know, it's not that everybody should be able to do that, although it'd be wonderful if we all could, but it's that we should aspire to that broadness of knowledge because actually both of those things are human. You speak also in the book about a distinction between a kind of analogue way of reading and a digital way of reading, where the brain flickers between perception and analysis. I was wondering, isn't that the perfect state for reading a book of non-fiction? I think it probably is. And certainly when I was at university, I, I, I used to do it. I used to get several books on the same topic and flick between them and try to contrast and so on and draw out a narrative. And the point about that, for me, is that you end up with your own perception of what's going on rather than just receiving one from a kind of authoritative text which again is a kind of distribution of power, distribution of authority, um, which is something that the internet definitely does. I'm actually really interested, and I'm, I'm going to try and find a, 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 a bunch of people, but a, a neuroscientist and so on, to talk to me about this. I'm wondering, there's an extraordinary description of reading in Proust and the Squid, Marion Wolf's book, about how uninterrupted conventional reading works and how it's an important part of the formation of the modern mind. And what I want to know 
now is what would happen if this kind of synthetic reading became the dominant mode of, of living. Would that actually be so bad? I doubt that it would. I mean, Socrates uh, reportedly was worried about uh, literacy, leading people to, to, to stop remembering things properly and to stop thinking for, the, for themselves because they could just go and read a book. And here we are having a kind of similar discussion. And it seems a little bit silly to link the two, but, you know, let, let's try and see what happens. You know, maybe what we're talking about as we move to a, a sort of a creative way of reading is a, a new way of being, which is actually quite good because heaven knows the pure reading version hasn't necessarily been great at avoiding catastrophe over the last couple of hundred years. So loads and loads of stuff there that I can't wait to challenge you on. But I'm now Excellent. going to bring in our other studio guest, who is Simon Ings, novelist, uh, science writer, biographer of the eye, as I love to say, although actually you probably <laughs> challenged me on that description. It's no, that's, that's a, a very good description. I like that. <laughs> I like that. I'll go with that. I'll go and, with uh, that. But also um, now an editor of a new magazine, the second edition of which is about to hit the stand. I'm working with new scientists on a new magazine of uh, futures and fiction called Arc. It's available in electronic forms as well as in paper. Is it full of techno trickery? Up to a point. We're quite happy to deal with technology, but we're much more interested in the future, and the two aren't synonymous. The future isn't technological. The future is made by people who use technologies of one sort or another. The future isn't one place that we're heading towards. The future differs according to your locale. Uh, the future, like all politics, is irremediably local. And no matter how much you, you look for these globalising ideological statements, everything reduces to locality and individual response. With all our technology, the world is and will remain a, an awful lot bigger than we are. Nick, you actually have a short story in the second edition. I do, yes. Which is about... Futures. It is. It's a, it's a far-fetched story this time. I was indulging myself slightly, and Simon was kind enough to say that that was okay. It's a mind-body story. It's it's about moving between bodies and, and consciousness and what it actually means and so on. It's it's also a little bit about embodied cognition, which is something New Scientist has been talking about a lot recently. The idea that we think not just with the brain, but with the rest of the body. And if you look, for example, down into the left, and I ask you to, to mention some random numbers, you will produce lower random numbers than if I ask you to look up and to the right. So, Simon, this magazine mixes fiction and non-fiction or do you just have two different streams going on? They do interact quite strongly. We're not attempting to be any kind of journal of record. We're a, a magazine of speculation and we come out of a generation that has really, really enjoyed TED Talks until they started giving us a migraine three years in. And we really loved, and some of us worked, on the original Wired, which is a fantastic magazine which has a, a strange sort of non-ideology, the ideology that technology doesn't come with an ideology, which was terribly exciting in the early 90s and is sort of dying the death now. So we're looking for the, for the next thing. And we came to the conclusion that people were sufficiently comfortable with talking about future, sufficiently comfortable with engaging with speculative ideas just as part of their general culture, that we could really start to play with the form and say, well, actually, is it normal to think about the future in this way? Is it normal to come up with ideas of what society, this gigantic monolithic concept society will, will be in the future? What if the future is individual? What if it's a much more Jane Austen-like future in which you're looking for your own personal advantage each time? So we, we're really exploring the idea of the future and the, the idea of speculation. And of course, for that, you need fiction, because fiction doesn't have to trot out a line. Fiction doesn't have to follow a logical sequence. Fiction can engage with the fact that the world is so big that Ambiguity is a given no matter how carefully you, you divide it up and you split it up. There are two things that have come up here that Nick raised that I want to unpick a bit. And one is your thing about digitisation is another way of understanding. The fact is that our commerce and our civics, our social interactions are predicated upon the fact that we haven't escaped the bounds of space and time and the body, that it takes a certain amount of time to accomplish something, that if I say something to Nick in private, Richard won't hear it, who's in the next room. So we can get something done because I can just get both of you on side by saying the right thing to each of you. Now that's a very normal human process. The moment you take that grit away, the moment you take that friction away, so that our only form of communication is Twitter, I'll never get you guys to do what I think would be really good for the three of us, because it'll go wrong in those ways that would have been so easy to sort out if I'd spoken to you privately. 
Nonetheless, Twitter's around and we have to work out how to use it. And it's a constant learning process. You, you're in about... danger of painting yourself as Luddites, it's, it strikes me, with all your talk about clockwork and your talk about hammers and things like that. But actually, you're both embracing technology in really interesting ways. So you've, Simon, you've imbe- embedded QR codes in your novel. Uh, and Nick, you've provided links at the end of each chapter so that the discussion could continue online. Yes, uh, we've got links at the end of each chapter in the electronic edition and in the print edition to take you to a, a website where you can discuss whether or not you think I'm a lunatic. It's not so much uh, being a Luddite, it's about it's about sort of what's the right direction to go at a given moment with a given technology, what's the right use and what's not. And I think we do need to kind of to get to grips with the idea that technology is all around us and that it's going to remain that way, as Simon says, because, you know, it changes the way things happen. But I think also, yes, you know, you have to be able to take ownership of the technology and say, OK, you know, actually, I don't need to have the phone switched on right now. You know, I'm with my kids. And if someone really needs to get me, they will gasp, use the landline. You know, um, if there's an emergency, I'll be able to hear because there are sirens in the street. You say you're not a Luddite, but there's a deep sadness in, in both of your work about the, the, the modern world that we've created. I mean, in Dead Water, there's Eric Moyes, he regrets this paper life he's constructed by imagining the container box. And you've got in Angel Maker Joe, lovely Joe Sport, he mistrusts duplication. He wants to sit at a thing that's been made. That's another thing. That's the, the issue of whether mass produced physical objects are socially and politically imply a diminution of the importance of individuality. Um, and that's a discussion which has been going on in design for a long time. It's basically the, the discussion between Ruskin and people in his vein and, and modernists and so on who are sort of saying, you know, embellishment is bad and decadent. And indeed, I think Adolf Luz said it was sexually degenerate to embellish design. Um, there's this extraordinary thing which happens with Levis and Snow as well. As soon as people start getting uh, upset about this kind of discussion. They bring in sex and they say, your side of this discussion is sexually degenerate. It becomes about biology very fast, which I find fascinating, although I haven't sort of looked at it seriously. But you, I, you seem so nostalgic for the great game, for the sort of for the possibility of heroism. I'm, I'm not for a second suggesting that the modern world that we have is a magnificent world. I just don't believe the problems in it are the responsibility of digital technology. In fact, I think digital technology in many cases is a solution that we developed. We moved into the towns from the countryside, we which could have balkanized us somewhat, could have broken us up, but we developed communications technologies to allow us to know not physical neighbours, but online neighbours, people who have similar interests, similar feelings, similar situations, so that we could continue to be a society, unconsciously, you know, whatever. It may be less teleological than that, but there's an element of that. But I look at the modern world and I think, wow, yeah, no, we've got some really serious problems and we need to fix them, but that's not because of digitisation. The spirituality that we plaster over our technological fixes, I think, is the other main driver for over-egging, over-hyping, over-applying our digital culture. There's a magnificent book by um, a guy called Jaron Lanier called you, you Are Not a Gadget, which is describing the way in which we fall in love so much with our technology. We're so desperate to become part of something bigger that we actually put ourselves into smaller and smaller boxes because our technology isn't as developed as we would like it to be. And it can't actually be as developed as we would like it to be because once you've produced one complicated program, the next complicated program that sticks on top of it will actually make the first program go wrong. So there is a limit to how sophisticated your digital culture will ever get. And going back to the Eric Moiser in, uh, in Deadwater, his regret is really a, one about ethics rather than about technology because he's realised that he's no longer making money in order to run a shipping company. He's run a shipping company in order to make money. I mean, this has done more damage to the capitalist system than anything, is its, its love of number forgetting the activity that it was supposed to drive in the first place. What is fascinating about Deadwater is, in a way, the commodities, the, the goods that are being moved around the world, become the engine of the novel. They do, and they are also abstracted. I play the piano. These days, not that many people actually bother to go and pick up a piano, which is very cheap, by the way, because nobody plays them anymore. But what people can do, and what we can do, is we can buy an historical recording from the best pianist in the world and play it on an iPod and not even own the CD, just have the signal coming down a wire and not be able to give that experience to our children because no one sorted out the legals about um, bequeathing digital assets yet. And so you take a human activity, um, a, a human process, you commodify it into a package, and then you take the package away, and everything disappears. So what I really wanted to do with Deadwater was um, write about 
physical things, but point out that everything is getting abstracted. But rather than, you know, do a book about the music industry, I mean, who needs another book about the music industry? I decided to just put everything in a container and send it off to sea, because if that's not abstracted, I don't know what is. To reduce everything to a number on a manifest, it be somewhere in the world that only a computer knows where it is. One other thing about Deadwater is it's a, a lot about waves, isn't it? There's a very abstruse theory at the heart of it. I have a little material. bit of advice to any would-be writer, and that is when you start your novel, don't make your central metaphor the way in which a propeller, when it mixes waters of different density, creates a lot of froth and doesn't send the boat anywhere. <laughs> Dead water is what happens to your ferry in a uh, fjord uh, above the Arctic Circle. Basically, you have a, a, a small layer of superchilled water on the surface, and below that you have a layer of cold, but not excessively cold water underneath. And the relative densities of those two layers are so great, and they just meet at the point where your propeller is on your regular ferry. So if you try and turn a propeller in that, you're actually creating bubbles of water within water and you don't get anywhere. Can I ask one question really quickly, because I'm curious. Have you read Cold Comfort Farm? Yes. Is it a science fiction novel? No, I wouldn't have thought so. Right, so if I told you that it was a novel where everyone communicated by video phone set in an alternative universe where we went to war in South America, would you think of that as a science fiction novel? Because it is. That's, that's Cold Comfort Farm. And at the time, it was exactly that. It was a futuristic novel. But no one thinks of it that way. And th that's a very strange thing, because actually, at the time, she was writing, and you know, technology was part of her writing. But now, if you did that, you'd be having a conversation about whether you'd written a speculative fiction novel. So what happened to us? And this is why I think it's important to, to do this, to bring technology and science back into literature, because otherwise, essentially, Literary fiction, mainstream fiction, will end up as a, a subset of historical fiction, and that's just weird. We need, as a culture, to be having this dialogue. Uh, you say that we need, as a culture, to be dealing with these questions, but you also say, and I think you're probably right, that it's easier to convince with a dystopia than a positive vision of the future. Do we not have a responsibility to try and imagine together a future that we really want to be part of? Oh, goodness, no. That's the last thing we should do. Uh, we should be as bleak and as frightening as possible. I'm mean, going that's that's to disagree. <laughs> Because we need to, um, um, basically, if you were to do a TED Talk and you have your seven minutes of talking about how wonderful the world is, you will create some sort of very rational argument, uh, narrative argument that makes sense. What you can't do is have a nightmare. What you can't do is have a paddy or a panic attack. What you can't do is just feel reluctant and it's going to take you six months to work out why you're reluctant about this thing. And there's something wrong and you can't put your finger on it. And in the end, the future is built out of those moments. And so we need to recognise those moments. Otherwise, we're just going to be a bunch of grinning Stalinists running about saying that all is going to be wonderful because of my wonderful device. It might be a wonderful device, but let's work out what's going to go wrong because people are like that. We've evolved to respond to danger and it's fun. It's so much fun. This is, you know, it's... the it, um, dystopias are only bleak when four people are sitting around a table trying to be rational about them. Dystopias are hysterically enjoyable. So I think it's nice to have something to aspire to. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Both of my novels are dystopian in the present and they reach for the possibility of a utopian future. And I think that is something that we need. I think we should have hope. I think we have to recognise that if we're going to have a bright future, it's going to be because we choose it and we make it and we work for it. And also, and this is more important really in a way, because uh, people say the end justifies the means and it doesn't because you only ever live with the means. I think the, the most important thing is, is, is this thing of there is no such thing as a state of peace or a state of, of kind of good economics. It's a constant process and it's maintained by action. You don't get to a kind of plateau of perfect society and just sit there, or good society and just sit there. You maintain it every single day, otherwise it falls off the edge. You might say that it's in unstable equilibrium, like, a, like an egg balanced on its point. It's very, very easy to knock it over, and so you have to keep maintaining its, its goodness. Nick Harkaway, Simon Ings and Richard Lee there. But the dystopian prophecies keep on coming. Here's Ben Marcus reading from his latest novel, The Flame Alphabet. In the months before our departure, most of what sickened us came from our sweet daughter's mouth. Some of it she said, and some of it she whispered, 
and some of it she shouted. She scribbled and wrote it and then read it aloud. She found it in books and in the mail, and she made it up in her head. It was soaked into the cursive script she perfected at school, letters ballooning with heart-dotted eyes, vowels defaced into animal drawings. Each piece of the alphabet that she wrote looked like a fat molecule engorged on air, ready to burst. How so very dear. The sickness washed over us when we saw it, when we heard it, when we thought of it later. We feasted on the putrid material because our daughter made it. We gorged on it, and inside us it steamed, rotted, turned rank. Esther sang as she walked through the house. Her voice was toneless from the throat in a frequency high in warding power, a voice with a significant half-life, a noxious mineral content, that is, if it could be frozen and crystallized, something then beyond our means or imagination. If her voice could have been made into a smoke, we would have known. If you heard it, you were thoroughly repelled. She muttered in her sleep and awake. She spoke to us and to others, into the phone, out the window, into a bag. It didn't matter. Nice things, mean things, dumb things. Just a teenager's chatter, like a tour guide to nothing, stalking us from room to room. Blame and self-congratulation, and a constant narration of this, that, and the other thing, in low-functioning, if common, rhetorical modes, in occasions of speech designed not particularly to communicate, but to alter the domestic acoustics, because she seemed to go dull if she wasn't speaking or reading or serving somehow as a great filter of words. She did it without thinking, and she did it to herself, and it was we, alone, who were sickened. But of course, we'd find out it was others, too. Others, and others, and others. It's a brutal story in which adults start falling sick because of their children's speech. Words and writing, even making signs, also become fatal. It's all pretty bleak. So, Richard asked him on the line from our New York studio why he was compelled to take on such a desperate scenario. Well, it seems almost logical to me. I think that... uh The power of language is underestimated, and we're always told it's being debased and hollowed out and gutted, and actually, when I hear words, I find them painful and too meaningful and too resonant and too strong, and and I suppose it's an escalation of something I feel all around me, and I wanted to write some fiction that did exaggerate or amplify a condition that I observe and that I experience, that language is enormously potent, but what if it were so potent that it completely undid us? What if we sort of could see its effects rather than simply imagine them? Now, I'm just wondering if you can evoke for us a little bit of the world of the book. The book opens with the narrator, Sam, and his wife, Claire, feeling sick for reasons they can't determine. And when their teenage daughter goes away on a class trip, they start to feel better. And it creepily dawns on them that possibly she's the cause of their illness. And they, because when she returns home, they fall sick again. And they piece it together that it's her language that's sickening them. They're, they're quite isolated, but they start to figure out that this is going on everywhere. And lots of finger pointing and scapegoating occurs about who's the cause of this. Is it children? Is it is it all language? And is it just Jewish children? And uh, the plot thickens after that. But mm-hmm. it turns out really that language itself is quite toxic, and one would do well to avoid it. The book isn't just bitter and angry, but almost disgusting. Uh, the, <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's kind of, I mean, there's this, the symptoms of the adults, they're kind of ashen <clears throat> complexions and the sour smells, and there's this kind of, there's this listener that they plug in that's covered in burning gel. Uh, I'm wondering, if, are you trying to provoke? Interesting you say that. I, I certainly wasn't sitting in my room rubbing my hands together in glee, thinking, and now I'm going to write the most disgusting book in the world. I I suppose with the symptoms of the illness, it seemed that a visceral description of them would be most convincing, and I wanted to be convincing. The listener that you describe, which is an apparatus that they have in their synagogue that allows them to listen in to sermons from a rabbi, which are piped in from underground cabling, that's a different story to me, and I think I 
rather than it being disgusting, I, I was hoping it would be more enigmatic and maybe unknowable, odd, curious, sort of uh, compelling. There's a kind of Cronenberg-esque kind of mashup between the organic and the technical, the fluids that are involved. It's it's a close to the gag reflex sometimes. You know, I think these are all elemental kind of. Certainly, I, my ideal reader reaction is not one of retching. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the phenomenon starts with Jewish children. Again, is this, is this some kind of challenge, some kind of uh, provocation or some kind of warning? Well, sure it is. In the book, it is. It's, it's a piece of scapegoating enacted by the villain in the book, uh, Murphy, who has certain designs on a kind of secret knowledge that he believes to exist uh, with this obscure possibly non-existent religious sect, a Jewish religious sect. So the villain believes that science and medicine have come up empty in response to this language toxicity. So what other field of knowledge and insight is there but religion? And I'm Jewish and I'm fairly interested in the, in the secrecy and the unknowability of Kabbalah, not in a practicing sense, but in a philosophical sense that the tenets of Kabbalah are somehow constructed in a way that defies understanding, if that makes sense, that, that the actual tenets of the philosophy can't be grasped. If you find that you've grasped them, then you're surely wrong, which is, to me, an incredible taunt, right? To build into some system of knowledge, the, the, the sort of um, antidote to understanding. So... This is all swirling around in the book. Mm. Mm. There's also a kind of perversion of our everyday notions of care, the idea of that, that it comes literally out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, and that kind of that 19th century ideal of children who should be seen and not heard. Do, do you have kids yourself? Do you, do you wonder what they're going to make of this stuff? I do. I have two kids. I had to pause for a moment and count. I think, though, you know, I, I, I'm not looking to write fiction that simply makes everybody feel better nor really am I doing the reverse, but, but language is something I care about so deeply that I kind of can't stand it. And for me, writing a book is sometimes about reversing the things I'm most passionate about in order to enter a space that I find difficult, hard to think about, hard to deal with, hard to understand. And I feel that's what interests me. So the book opens with the parents essentially forced to leave their child, which to me is one of the most unthinkable things that I can imagine. I can't, sitting here talking to you now, picture a circumstance where I would willingly leave my kids. So putting a narrator into that circumstance it tests me in a, in, as a writer in a way that I find interesting. Mm. The, the book is also constructed in a way to try and make the reader complicit. I mean, you've, your first person voice, your, your beginning with that not quite yet happened perfect, that, that problematic re nature of reading a text about how text is toxic. Is, is this a way of exploring the complicities with which life in the West is inevitably involved? The possibility of writing a book or publishing a book or reading a book that, that makes us complicit in kind of in world structures that are in unjust? I don't know. Another approach would have been to take a broader, almost sociological perspective that tracked the source of this illness and did a sort of ethno ethnographic narrative. Uh, and, and what I became excited about was a single person with a very flawed character becoming victim to something and wrestling with his own sense of responsibility as a father, but also his own selfishness and desire to be well and to live to hell with anyone. So a single story seemed a lot scarier. And I also realized there would be so much he would not know. So and Some people have read this book and said, well, how can we don't, you know, we don't learn what really happened and what, oh, what this disease really was. And it I think it, that presumes some overarching omniscient narrator who's going to supply us with information. But if you're a single person in a crisis, what's so scary is all you don't know. I want to ask if literature and literary fiction in particular has got a, a problem with the future. Why, why are dystopias like this so much easier to believe than something that's a little more optimistic? Kafka has a great line on this, that you know, the positive is already given. And, and I think a lot of our entertainment does help us not think about the worst. And, and literature does occasionally 
take this <laughs> darker task up and try to illustrate a, a nightmare. I think of Thomas Bernhardt as, as one writer who, who does that really ferociously. I suppose I, I, I'm not so attracted to very happy stories, nor can I really think of too many examples in literature of safe, easy stories that make us feel good. Maybe it's just a form of narcissism to want to tell stories about your demise. Maybe, you know, you're, you're just getting a chance to write your tombstone before you die. Another grim view of the future there from Ben Marcus. His novel, The Flame Alphabet, is published by Granter. And you can read a review of that by James Lasden on guardian.co.uk slash books and in the Guardian's Saturday Review. The big news of the week has of course been the death of one of the masters of the science fiction universe, Ray Bradbury. Barack Obama, no less, said that Bradbury's gift for storytelling reshaped our culture and expanded our world. He understood that our imaginations could be used as a tool for better understanding, a vehicle for change and an expression of our most cherished values. Our last word on Bradbury will come in Guardian Saturday Review from Margaret Atwood, who explores his relationship with American Gothic. It's no coincidence, she writes, that he was descended from Mary Bradbury, convicted as a witch in 1692 during the notorious Salem witchcraft trials. But I'm afraid you'll have to wait for that. There's plenty on the site to be getting on with, including testimonials from Neil Gaiman among a host of other fans of The Great Man. In the meantime, however many of us are benefiting from both present and future advances, it's not the same for everyone. As Ian Goldin of TED Talks explained. The two Achilles heels of globalisation. There's the Achilles heel of growing inequality, those that are left out, those that feel angry, those that are not participating. Globalisation has not been inclusive. The second Achilles heel is complexity, a growing fragility, a growing brittleness. What happens in one place very quickly affects everything else. This is systemic risk, systemic shock. For more great downloads, go to guardian.co.uk forward slash audio. Don't forget to start your free 14-day trial of audible.co.uk and to download your free audiobook. Head to guardian.co.uk slash audible.